Joseph Scarborough here, and we are looking at my Sesame Street scale model. I've shared pictures of this on the internet before in the past, and a few people made the suggestion that I actually do a video about it as well. And I figured now was as good a time as any to do it, because as a matter of fact, Sesame Street is celebrating its 50th anniversary this year. So this is actually going to be the first of two videos that I'm actually planning for uh, the 50th anniversary. The other one is going to be a collaboration effort, and you'll hear more about that later. But for right now, we're just taking a look at my scale model here. And we will be taking a little virtual tour of it here just momentarily. But first, we're going to go into a little bit of an oral history about the model. So... This might be really boring, so if you want, you can skip this part. You don't have to listen to it. Just skip ahead to the uh, to the tour of it. But let me get the camera off the tripod here, and we'll begin uh, right over here. Here's all these years that are etched into the sidewalk, and I apologize for the glare from the light there. And as you can see, the first year is 2001. That is the year that I first built this model. And way back then, my intentions were to make this model look just as the street did on the show. And you'll notice that certain years there are highlighted in gold. Well, those are years that the model went through significant changes and overhauls such as 2002 there for example when the street on the show went through a few significant changes that year so did my model and I kept this up up until about 2007 and that's when the model entered what I called permanent season 38 mode and the reason for that is because the following year with season 39 uh, there were just way too many new changes to the street on the show that I just couldn't accommodate on my model. Like the bigger community garden in the back, or 123 having a new back door, or Hooper's store being widened, and so I kept my model, as I said, in quote-unquote permanent season 38 mode. And then I decided around 2010 and 2011 that, you know what, I'm just going to make the model look the way I want it to look. And so it went through a complete redo, mixing a little bit of old school, new school, and a few original touches as well, which we're getting ready to see. So that's it for the oral history. So now let's get to the actual tour here. As I tried to squeeze the camera into little spaces here, start off with way over yonder the subway station that was added in season 30 after it used to be in the around the corner set and no I was not a fan of around the corner to be honest with you not too many people were but here is one of my original touches this is a travel agency as you can see it did used to be the fix-it shop and as I mentioned a minute ago when I would make the model look like it did on the show, when the fix-it shop went to the mail-it shop on the show, it did as well on my model, and then when it went back to the fix-it shop on the show, it went back to the fix-it shop on the model. So why is there a travel agency here when on the show it's a laundromat? Well, I got to thinking that a travel agency or a visitor center or what have you seem like the kind of business that you would find in a big city like New York. What with visitors coming in all the time and perhaps, you know, local residents planning travels and vacations and what have you. So I just thought it would be a good touch for the model. But it's interesting because here just a year or two ago, I heard a blurb on the radio saying that uh, travel agencies as a business is actually kind of dying. So... Well, oh well. <laughs> and here's this door here. It goes up to the apartment up there that used to be Bob's apartment. Now Cookie Monster lives there, so I changed that little stained glass window up there to look like a cookie jar. 
And now here's Hooper's store, and Hooper's store is actually really interesting. Um, I personally, I never really minded so much that Hooper's store kept modernizing over the years, mainly because I felt like that was a realistic reflection of, you know, times changing and locales and what have you. And um, actually, it on my model, the Hooper store did look more like a modern convenience store what with a striped awning and a slick exterior and what have you, but um, I did actually hear a few years back, as you can see, bring back the taxi checkerboard tile on the front, and I almost want to give, uh, I almost want to take credit for giving production designer David Gallo that idea because I did it on my model before he did on the show, but I know I didn't give him that idea. But the reason why I brought back the tile wasn't necessarily because I thought Hooper's store had lost its identity or anything. I just thought it was aesthetically pleasing. And when they added this neon sign on the show, I just fell in love with that. I thought it was such a great inner city touch that I had to add it to my model as well. But then I got to thinking that, you know, the tile and the old neon sign there really clashed with the modern and contemporary look of the store. So back in 2017, I decided to follow suit and I gave Hoopers here a retroactive redesign to look as if it's just sat there and aged for 50 years. And now we're going to move over into... Hold on just a second. We're going to move over into the arbor area here. Now... The two, my two favorite locations on Sesame Street have always been the Arbor area and Big Bird's Nest area. And my earliest memories of Sesame Street are from those old My Sesame Street home video tapes from the mid and late 80s. So it was very important to me that I make these two areas look exactly as they did during that period. And as you can see, that's what I've done with the Arbor area here. Made it look like it did in the... 80s. Uh, this trellis here outside uh, the side door of Hooper's store there, that's actually a recent addition. I just added that a uh, few years back. And as a matter of fact, I did with these uh, with the staircase on the carriage house here as well. Uh, up until a few years ago, it was actually, uh, well, let me show you. It was actually kind of like this Fisher Price playset here, just flat but a few years back I decided to build up the staircase here for the carriage house and it was quite a painstaking process but I'm really pleased with how it turned out and we got the tire swing there and this structure behind the carriage house that ha you can partially see the alphabet on it I actually have a theory of what that building is I think it's a partial view of the facade of an alphabet factory because it seemed like particularly in the early years of the show that the residents of Sesame Street always had an ample supply of letters and even numbers on hand for any given little uh, educational bit so I, I'm thinking this may have been an alphabet factory of course that's just a theory I don't know and I do want to point out one little thing here before we move on these table and chairs I had those custom made for me I found a gentleman on Etsy named Matthew Landis and he runs an Etsy shop called Glow Steel Forge he's a 3D printer and he usually prints uh, items for tabletop games like Dungeons and Dragons and things like that but he also does custom orders and he is really great to do business with I mean he will actually go over each and every single little detail with you just to ensure that your order is exactly as you want it to be so uh, if you ever need anything like that I would definitely check him out like I said he's on Etsy and I do have another set of table and chairs but I usually keep that on the roof of one two three and now we're gonna go just real quick to a different angle over here it's kind of difficult to get into but you'll see that the side of Hooper's store here, there's that side window that was added in season 30. 
but you'll also notice that there's a mural here as well. And Hooper Store used to have various murals painted on the side wall in the old days. But, you know, I never was really able to find good uh, angles and photos of those murals, not even really on Muppet Wiki. So, I decided to put in an original mural of my own, which, as you can see, is mostly food and groceries, which I think is rather apropos for Hooper Store, which is not only a little store, but also like a lunch counter as well. So now, we're just going to move on over here. Two, one, two, three, Sesame Street. Put the tree back in place there. And one, two, three, Sesame Street. I mean, it's timeless. It's timeless. I mean, it can really fit into any era of the show. But as I mentioned earlier, when I made changes to the model based on changes on the show, back in like uh, 2002, 2003, when one, two, three, repainted its doors and window frames to red on the show. They were changed to red on the model and when they went back to green two years later on the show they went back to green on the model as well. So I mean again you know one two three is just timeless and there, there's really not much to say about it. But now we're gonna move on over here to Big Bird's nest area. Well we're gonna get back there try my best anyway and again as I mentioned earlier I wanted wanted Big Bird's Nest area to be old school as well so as you can see you got the aged construction doors here which is really actually the uh, really the only change made to the show in recent years that I don't particularly care for uh, I realize those construction doors really don't mean much anymore but I mean just the familiarity of them that's what I miss now that they're gone. And I have been asked before about this little sign with Big Bird's name and address on it. I, I am aware that that's where a basketball hoop was, a netless basketball hoop, but the sign that I put there instead is another one of my original touches because really when you think about it, how can anyone play basketball in that spot? There's just too many, you know, blocks there, you know, you got that little fence there to the right. Oscar's trash can set up to the left here, you know, uh, mailbox, lamppost, things like that. That's not a really good open area for basketball, as opposed to, say, you know, this little bushel basket on the carriage house here. But we're going to get ready to go down this alley here. And one thing I'm going to point out, too, and this is something that I only recently realized in recent years. Uh, this brick wall that's been next to Big Bird's Nest all these years, those are actually recycled from the Around the Corner set. As it turns out, half the wall down there was the side wall of the Furry Arms Hotel, which is why those fire escape windows are smaller than others. And this part of the wall here was the side wall of Finders Keepers. And... In the older days of the model, this alley actually used to be much, much wider than it is now. As a matter of fact, it was about twice as wide. And it used to, ha Oscar's Sloppy Jalopy used to be parked way back here. But there's no room for it anymore because it's a whole lot narrower now. So now we're going to try to get into Big Bird's nest area here and again as you can see I made it try to make it look as it did in the 80s you got this uh, excavation back here and the oil barrels over here and can somebody explain to me how it is that Big Bird had a ceiling fan back in those days when he doesn't even have a ceiling I don't understand that and I don't know if you can really see it well or not, but that mailbox there, that was another thing I had custom made for me by Matthew. And lastly, we're going to go up here. Oh, sorry, bumped the camera into the light. We have the roof of 123. It's bare right now, but I usually have it dressed up with, like, Bert's pigeon coop 
in the back corner there. And as I said, there's another set of tables and chairs that I have up here. And usually like potted plants in the summertime, in the springtime. And I, I guess I should make note that I dress the model up for the seasons. There will be fake leaves covering it for fall and fake snow covering it for winter. So get the camera back on the tripod here. And people have also asked me if I have figures of the Muppets to put on it, and I do. So I'm going to start doing that. And while I'm doing that, you may have noticed that throughout this video, you've been hearing city noises. I actually have a CD with ambient tracks that I mixed. There's four of them. There are 20-minute loops of uh, city ambiance like distant traffic and things like that. Uh, the tracks, there's day, night, winter day, and winter night. And as I said, they're each 20 minute loops of city ambiance. The day, which you're hearing right now, has birds chirping and kids playing, occasional dog barking or other things like that. And night, is pretty similar only instead of birds chirping and kids playing there's crickets chirping and it's peppered with big birds snoring and winter day and night are like this as well except winter day has more kids playing less birds chirping and winter night has no crickets and hardly any traffic but faint wind blowing. So there is my scale model of Sesame Street and this video of it which I've done in celebration of season 50. So I hope you enjoyed this video and I hope you enjoyed taking a look at my model here and I'll just let you look at it for a little while longer before we sign off here.